Hello everyone, my name is Maya Khan and I'm the Brand Content Curation and Communications Lead at Think City, an urban rejuvenation organization based in Kuala Lumpur, Penang and Johor in Malaysia. Thanks for joining us for this session. The topic at hand is disruption and the creative industries. We live in the age of disruption where as city makers we have to contend with disruptions, not just of the revolutionary technology variety, but also disruptions to our lives in the form of terrorism, disease, climate disasters, political upheavals, and more. Joining me today is Montira Horayangura Unakul from UNESCO Bangkok. Montira works at UNESCO Bangkok on programs in Asia Pacific to safeguard and ensure the sustainable development of cultural heritage with a focus on world heritage. She has authored and edited publications related to heritage management, urbanism and sustainable tourism. Montira has a background in economics, East Asian studies, architecture and urban planning from Harvard University, University of California, Berkeley and Chulalongkorn University. Welcome Montira. Thanks very much, Maya. Thanks for having me here. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. You did very well. Great. So tell us a little bit about your work at UNESCO. So as many people um, may know, uh, UNESCO is the only United Nations agency that deals in the, with the area of culture. And so um, our remit extends from heritage in all of its forms. So heritage sites, most well known, of course, are world heritage sites, but other heritage sites as well um, to heritage objects um, such as museum collections and other types of collections, um, cultural heritage that is under under the sea or underwater cultural heritage, as we call it, um, as well as um, intangible cultural heritage, uh, which has become increasingly well recognized around the world. But there's also a second kind of um, pillar to the work that we do, which has to do with the promotion of creativity as well. And so it's not just about, you know, um, basically taking care of old things, but it's also about um, promoting new ways of expressing cultural diversity, which for UNESCO we feel is really kind of central to kind of quality of life as well as sustainable development. So if we can encourage us as much cultural diversity, whether it's in sort of traditional forms or in contemporary forms, uh, then we feel that you know this um, contributes to sustainable development in in all of its dimensions, including kind of financial dimension. Well, Bangkok, Thailand is one of the greatest cities um, when it comes to creativity. Well, what do you think contributes to that? You know, um, I believe it's something cultural. I think uh, I think you're right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Bangkok and then before it, you know, um, other um, capital cities, as well as now increasingly a number of secondary cities all around Thailand have really been historic crossroads um, for trade and for cultural exchange. And so our previous capital, Utia, which is also a World Heritage Site, was, you know, one of the largest um, and most cosmopolitan cities of its day and had traders um, and trading communities resident in the city from around the world. And so as a result, in terms of gastronomy, in terms of art, uh, in terms of um, other forms of art, uh, culture, such as architecture, um, the city you know, was really kind of this, this vibrant um, uh, melting pot, but also at the same time, you know, a major um, kind of uh, economic um, engine and, and a major trading hub uh, with trade um, as far afield as you know Japan and so forth. And so, so I think it's it's this historical legacy which continues to this day. I mean, Thailand has the fortune to be um, blessed by geography, so it's really very central in terms of Southeast Asia. Um, you know, central between the trading routes between uh, India and Arab, you know, Arab states as well as China. And so it's always been kind of this crossing point, whether it's overland trade or it's uh, maritime trade. And so I think that continues to this day. And so it's uh, it's an aviation hub. Um, a lot of people come here um, 
for business, but also for leisure. And so I think it's a combination of these things, as well as a kind of historical openness to accepting cultural influences, uh, which fosters the sense of creativity. So it's a combination of like encounters, which is people and ideas, as well as, you know, um, um, kind of this also kind of economic and kind of commercial legacy as well. Right. Well, uh, your work extends across the entire Asia Pacific region, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. our, our office is um, um, an Asia Pacific Bureau primarily for education, but we do a number of initiatives um, in the cultural field um, that are at a regional level, um, but then also a lot of operational projects either in Southeast Asia or, or just in Thailand. Right. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what your challenges were um, before COVID-19 and how these challenges have changed. You know, we it's interesting you say that because um, we have been doing um, a series of roundtables um, around the world as well as um, at, at a more local level. So here in Thailand, uh, UNESCO has uh, worked with um, our partner, the Creative Economy Agency of Thailand, uh, to bring together practitioners across the spectrum in the creativity sector. So musicians, filmmakers, visual artists, performing artists, people working in literature, design, architecture, uh, and so forth, um, to discuss with them what the impacts have been um, in their in their work, in their life, you know, um, in since the, the COVID pandemic has taken over. And what we're hearing from people is that, in fact, it's really been a deepening or um, a worsening of existing problems that were there before. And so, you know, the industry is really vibrant on the one hand here in Thailand. And I think a lot of people um, have seen great examples of Thai design in terms of fashion or whatever. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are a lot of sort of structural um, problems that have been pointed out um, by people working in this field. Um, as well as, you know, consumers and then even policymakers. And so um, the, the creative sector in Thailand is quite um, um, atomized. So people are kind of working in pockets and they don't necessarily have platforms either to meet each other or to exchange information or um, to, to do things with a more commercial perspective, like, you know, like selling um, cultural goods and services. Um, at the same time, this, this lack of kind of coherence across the sector or the people who are working in the sector has also made it difficult for them to, to lobby, you know, say the government for more support either financially or in terms of policies and other kind of aspects of, you know, what uh, we call the creative ecology, things that are needed to kind of ensure that creative industries um, and cultural industries can in fact flourish. And so, um, you know, the crisis, you know, has has in a way worsened all of that. But on the other hand, it's also um, created new opportunities. And so one of the um, roundtables that UNESCO convened at a global level was with uh, ministers of culture from around the world, like literally like from um, from over 100 um, countries. And um, what was interesting was um, to see the range of responses um, that different countries um, had in terms of responding to the pandemic, specifically in the culture sector. And so we had places like Korea already, you know, well known for its its um, attention to the culture and creative industry. Uh, and in fact, the government, you know, took it many steps further. So they gave, you know, um, kind of uh, financial um, bailouts to struggling artists and practitioners. They pumped money into um, creative institutions and cultural institutions like museums, you know, galleries and so forth. So people could uh, put their um, uh, content online. They even, you know, increased things like kind of from the IT side, like bandwidth and hardware to ensure that people could access this material, you know, with the kind of speed that I think Koreans are used to getting, you know, with their with their Internet. And so and then on the other hand, we had. Um, uh, from Indonesia, for instance, um, a similar range of, of you know, um, kind of support to the sector, but also things um, like sort of a reflective look at, you know, what is the meaning of the pandemic to us as like a society and how do we capture this moment as 
as an artistic moment, you know, that we want to kind of memorialize for future generations to come. And they did this open call all around the country for people to send in basically kind of art and, and, and other types of pieces that would be archived for the future, almost like this time capsule. And so and so I think it it really shows the role of, you know, the arts and creative industries both as a way of people and humanity making sense of ourselves. And so artists kind of, you know, holding up a mirror and, and trying to figure out, you know, what, what does it mean for us as people? But on the other hand, there's also like, you know, from a from a more like economic perspective, you know, so how do we how do we kind of how do we adapt ourselves to this new situation? And on the one hand, take advantage of people who are at home and wanting to stream um, new content online. Um, but on the other hand, maybe having to struggle with the lack of connection that comes from physical galleries and physical music spaces and, and all of that. Yeah, I guess um, uh, the lockdown situation is different from city to city, and therefore not all the issues are tied to physical locations and physical presence of audiences in order to sort of drive um, uh, their financial health. Um, uh, what were some of the problems that that they used to face before the pandemic then? Did they, was that discussed? Yeah, I mean, I think so things like um, lack of recognition as as a as an industrial sector, um, um, lack of um, financial support to um, culture and creative industries, um, lack of um, kind of legislation or regulation that would facilitate their work. So for instance, importing or exporting artworks into Thailand isn't recognized as art. I mean, it, it's sort of, it, it's assessed as the, the material of fabrication and then you're you're taxed accordingly, you know. So if you if you have metal sculpture, it's like taxed as metal and not as artwork. And wow. so th there's there's all of these kind of issues that are ingrained in the structure of, of the law and, you know, the regulatory framework, but also of of, of um, kind of um, the attention that maybe um, the state has paid or, or not paid enough to the sector. So, for instance, you know, the government had um, cash handouts to people um, and, and there was a lot of concern in the artist community that many artists somehow were not recognized as workers who would be eligible for such handouts. You know, some of them did did get these benefits, but but many of them struggled to to you know put in the paperwork and so forth uh, to do so. So I think I think these were problems that were already there beforehand, right? The lack of funding, the lack of policy support, the lack of um, um, kind of uh, legislative or regulatory support, um, the lack of networking platforms, etc. But it just became apparent, you know, what a problem it was at the time of the, the pandemic. So I'm really glad that you mentioned um, some of these issues have actually been resolved as a result of the pandemic. Um, for example, the lack of platforms, you know, and there's this big en masse uh, migration to the digital. And um, I also love how uh, the Indonesians are true artists. You know, they're worried about capturing the moment rather than, you know, yeah. like wondering where, where their next meal is coming from. I think that's great. Um, just going back to Bangkok for a little bit, what changes did you observe when it, um, when it came to public spaces and places of interest in Bangkok? Well, I mean, during the lockdown, um, of course, everything was closed and then people, um, you know, were not able to access um, either um, public venues and even private um, places such as galleries and so forth. And in fact, you know, sort of um, owners and proprietors of galleries were, were, were in fact um, um, expressing their concerns, you know, as, as the lockdown was phased out and then um, people were able to uh, go back. For instance, malls opened really quickly, like malls were like one of the first things to open. And then, but galleries were like not allowed to open at the same time as malls and gallery owners were like, well, I mean, what's the difference between going to a mall and a gallery? In fact, in a gallery, you can do crowd control and all of that much better, right? Because, you know, your space is sort of more under um, your regulation. And so, so, so I think there is, there is, there is definitely maybe not an attention to the, um, the potential and the importance of these types of cultural venues. And so I think um, that that was a concern in the early stages of lockdown and reopening. But now, you know, Thailand has has um, 
really been able to kind of keep our infection rates quite under control. And so as a result, everything is open now. So museums are open, heritage sites are open, galleries are open, um, pubs and bars are open. And so, so all of these types of venues are open. And so uh, it's just a question whether people are going back to them as much as before, or there's some sense of reluctance. You know, I think in Singapore, uh, the National Heritage Board did a did a did a study, and one of the things that was going to be a big issue in terms of the future of places like museums and galleries was people want a no touch experience. You know, so it's like, how do I go to a gallery or museum and not have to touch the door and touch this and touch that? And so, so it's that kind of, that kind of adaptation that I think is uh, being introduced to these kinds of places as physical places you know so um well singapore is uh they've got higher rates of infection and um but they're also at the very forefront of technology so it's interesting that uh to to sort of like keep an eye on them i guess um other other um, cities might be able to learn from them um and speaking of uh, creative cities you know what are the characteristics of a creative city and how do disruptions affect these cities and the creative industries? I think there's a really big literature out there that talks about the importance of kind of um, uh, physical agglomeration as as one of the key facilitators in um, in the creative ecology. So you know, just making sure that artists and practitioners and creative types have an opportunity to um you know bump into each other either it's surreptitiously or on purpose or whatever and so then we have all these you know um, um cities around the world trying to develop like creative districts and creative hubs and then uh, these places that people can meet and co-working spaces and all that kind of thing so i think i think um that is that is in a really uh, kind of still probably an important um, element of, of um, a creative city. In addition, of course, to all of all of the other things that I mentioned earlier, the funding, the policies and whatnot um, that allows this to happen, as well as, of course, also education as well. Um, that was another thing uh, that has come up in, in the discussions that we've been having in Thailand. Uh, the importance to upskill and reskill people working in the creative sector so that they're able to kind of meet the demands of the industry. You know, we have people coming out of film school and all they've ever taken is like, you know, classes on how to be a director and then in fact you know like not a lot of the work on a, you know as a, a film set is actually there's like one director and then there's like everybody else who has to do all the other stuff which is actually not taught in school so 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 there's there's that component as well and so but coming back to the issue of, of cities and then creative cities and disruption i mean i think on the one hand um people have moved a lot online, right? And so that people who never before staged online performances or virtual performances have have figured out how to collaborate virtually to put on these virtual types of events. Is this going to be like a lasting thing or was it only, you know, kind of a short term adaptation just to serve that moment? It's hard to say. I mean, I think in many under in many other industries like the energy sector or whatever right they're talking about really long-term transformation not just short-term adaptation and so so on the one hand maybe that's something that that the sector is going to have to bring on board more certainly digital transformation is is going to uh, has been accelerated and is going to be a key trend in the future but whether it's going to be solely digital or we're going to see basically hybrid models where there's bricks and mortar plus online experiences and you have a combination of these events, uh, whether it's events or, or you know, means of collaboration. Um, um, I think that's that's something that's probably going to have, you know, a lasting impact in the future that people have become accustomed to to, you know, a hybrid or a virtual model. And, and yeah, I mean, the this whole pandemic, I think, will probably have a lasting impact in terms of seeing people move if not entirely to a digital space, at least to a, a, a blended model of either collaboration or production of cultural goods and services, as well as um, um, consumption of cultural goods and services as well. And so, I mean, I think there was already, for instance, um, in countries like the States or whatever, you know, a move to like blended retail. So you could shop you should you could go to a shop and then kind of browse and then pick and whatever but then you could you know order online or you could order online and go pick it up at a shop and that kind of thing so and i think i think i think shops to survive will probably have to 
you know, offer both experiences online and, and, and on site um, to make that happen. And I think that's the case for, you know, um, the creative sector as well and the cultural sector. So whether it's, it's fashion outlets or it's, you know, um, performing arts or visual arts or uh, all that, uh, increasingly uh, we're already seeing people pivoting to online. And, you know, I mean, the thing with online is like the barriers to entry are so low, right? And we can see that with TikTok, you know, anyone with a phone can become the next, you know, cultural art phenomenon. But it's just how do you, how do you parlay your, you know, seconds of fame into like a long lasting revenue stream. So that's the real challenge that faces us. I mean, it's not yeah, hard to get online, but it's hard to make money online, right? I mean, even yeah. even on YouTube and whatever, you know, artists are complaining that they are just not getting fair, what, what they feel is fair remuneration for, for, what, what, for, for their content, so. So do you think there will be a criteria or even a listing, you, you know, UNESCO Creative City, um, but for the digital landscape, which means that you may not have that physical ecosystem, but you're really thriving online. Could, could that happen in the future? Um, I, I think I also wanted to get some clarification on, on kind of like what, what criteria UNESCO places in creative cities, you know, in, in the making of a creative city. I mean, um, I think many people would be familiar with the UNESCO Creative City Network, um, and there are over 250 cities around the world now that um, um, have been recognized as UNESCO Creative Cities. And there are UNESCO Creative Cities in various fields, so you could be recognized on the basis of um, gastronomy or design or folk art, or film, literature, media arts, music. Um, and by being recognized, uh, what's critical to note that um, it's 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 not that you necessarily are super, super well known in that field, but it's that you have a, a policy commitment, um, especially at the municipal level, to kind of grow that field. So you might just sort of be uh, an, um, like a new uh, player, say, in literature uh, or in media arts, uh, but because this is what you know, your city feels is going to be the wave of the future for you um, and you're totally committed in order to make sure that uh, this is going to, you know, create more jobs and then um, um, infuse into learning and then, um, you know, um, you know, see a, a growth in terms of practitioners and producers and so forth. So 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 that's that's really the main um, the main point. Um, with which um, you're you're looked at. So, how can creative cities manage the threat of disruption? Um, yeah, I think I guess cities have always been disrupted, right? Um, whether it was like the plague, or it's waves of new immigration, or it's um, major um, structural changes um, in the economy. So, for instance, like in the American Midwest, you know, the Rust Belt this whole post-industrial phenomenon that has put cities that were once, you know, powerhouses of industrial production basically out of business. Um, so, so I think, I think, I think that's, this is, this is, this is really a serious crisis, but it's, but it's nothing new. I mean, um, and, and many books have been written about this, you know, about um, waves of growth and then um, kind of contraction and then rebranding and then re like finding new identities and finding new um, reasons to be. And so uh, in any particular urban neighborhood, you know, that has been around for a while, you, you know, every five or 10 or 25 years, there's 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 quite often a quite substantial change, either, in, you know, the shops that are there, or the people who come to buy or whatnot. So I so I think this is in a way it's it's um, it's an opportunity, right? So if, if you look around Bangkok, um, there are a lot of shops and um, properties that are being, um, that have for sale or for, for lease signs up. I mean, a lot of, a lot of businesses have, have gone, gone out of business. So, you know, especially in hard hit sectors like the tourism sector, you know, Thailand is very dependent on our tour, tourism economy. Up to 30% of tourism businesses have gone bust. They have permanently left the market. You know, tour agencies, 
um, other types of uh, tourist related um, operators, you know, they, you know, you know, you can't survive when there are no, there are no overseas tourists. So, so, so the real question is, well, what next, right? I mean, what, 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 what do we do? Do we, do we uh, wait, you know, like we shutter, we shutter our spa business, um, and give up our, our location, um, but we wait until the tourists come back and then in 24 months or in 18 months you open up a spa again and then what happens if there's an, you know another crisis you know three years down the road then you close your spa again I mean or 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 are our cities and basically our economies and our workers going to pivot to other things right so maybe there's going to be decisions taken like, hey, maybe, hey, maybe Thailand is just way too tourism economy dependent. Maybe we need to move into like, you know, you know, software design and <laughs> other forms of service industries that take advantage of the workers that we have and whatever kinds of creative skills that they have. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. I think that's that's the that's the conversation that needs to be had, whether at a municipal level or at a national level, uh, in exactly. order to really think about well, you know, we can't just you know assume everything. Uh, clearly, clearly, things are not going to go back to normal anytime soon. So, so what yeah, is? and uh, you mentioned earlier as well that you know on a policy level there were already challenges that the creative industries were facing. Yeah. So, how can the public sector achieve more synergy? with the creative industries and um, do you have any case studies to share? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, so if we look at digital transformation for one, um, this is an area where I think, um, you know, the creative sector in terms of private enterprises and so forth, I think they can certainly uh, drive this change um, to a certain level, right? They, they could see a business opportunity or a market opportunity they could develop a product to fill that gap. You know, they could they could get out there and deliver that service. On the other hand, if the government is going to you know see this as an opportunity as well, then it means like they'll be doing things like the government of Korea did, right? So giving people grants to pivot their company from bricks and mortar to digital. They're going to be um, you know providing short courses or working with universities to provide short courses to reskill and upskill people in digital you know related skills and knowledge they're going to be giving tax breaks to companies that you know uh, are, are, are trying to do this kind of thing so uh, they're going to be providing you know low cost or, or no rent facilities uh, so that you know these kinds of startup industries can have a place to to uh, to rent um, um, while they're not able to you know generate any profits yet. So there there are so many ways that the government could support this, but I I think it it depends on having a kind of you know vision and a roadmap in place so that um, everyone is kind of moving in not the necessarily the same direction, but at least that there's this synergy that you talked about that can be exploited, that the government should do what government should do and the, and the private sector should do what private sector should do. Right. So do you have a, a sort of, um, do you have any ideas of how the creative industries are going to take shape in the future post COVID-19? Um, well, I think Digital transformation is definitely going to be, you know, a big thing that we're going to see. Um, um, I think there are still going to be a lot of industries that are, are are more focused on adaptation. So, you know, they have the same products. They're just trying to get it out to like a different audience, maybe, or through different means. Um, so, but I think, and related to sort of the digital transformation is that I think a lot of people are realizing that once you're no longer tied to like a storefront, you have, you know, basically the world at your feet, right? So you could have people who are coming to listen to your playing, uh, listen to your songs or, uh, you know, um, uh, download your, your, your illustrations or your stories or whatever. Um, and they could be from, you know, they're, they're not just going to be half from your city or your province or whatever, or your country, like they could be from wherever. So, so I think, I think there's going to be that whole, um, you know, breaking down of barriers as well, like geographic barriers. Um, so from, from the United Nations perspective, um, an important linkage is also with the issue of sustainable development and particularly with the sustainable development goals. I mean, I think worldwide there has been a lot of concern 
not just from the UN, but also um, civil society and other um, parts of um, um, the globe, that um, many of the issues embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals has been put um, on the back burner due to the COVID pandemic, uh, which has been treated primarily as a public health issue and then secondarily as a as an economic issue. Um, and so um, larger concerns or longer term concerns like climate change um, that are actually now having a really catastrophic effect in many places, including like uh, California and like, the West Coast in the US, um, these types of issues are, are falling by the wayside. And so on the one hand, it's, it's obviously a crisis because you know governments only have so much money and you know enterprises only have so much resources as well. But on the other hand, it's also an opportunity. And so if we're going to rebuild or build back better or you know pivot or do reimagine or all of these things that all of these many, many COVID related forums are talking about, you know, this is an opportunity to to kind of rethink the way that our industry um, is structured, um, its you know business models, you know, you know its key performance indicators, as well as you know, you know what what is the point of, of doing the work that we do, and so um, it's an opportunity to to think about you know who our beneficiaries really should be and uh, what kinds of value we should be creating. I mean, if we look at a kind of related industry to culture and, and creative industries, which is tourism, um, you know, a lot of a lot of governments see the value of, say, heritage as being related to tourism and being able to monetize that through tourism. But if you look at the structure of the tourism industry, right, it, it's this juggernaut primarily, which tries to create economic returns for basically big players. So the aviation industry. Uh, hospitality um, chains uh, and and other types of big players, and you know all of this you know effort to create community-based tourism and all other types of SMEs related to tourism, you know they they are really you know getting peanuts out of this whole tourism pie. So so if we're going to build back better, then we should consider whether there are new and alternative models about thinking about how to do business at heritage sites or with cultural institutions or with um, creative enterprises, right? So um, we don't necessarily have to fall back into the same old patterns of doing things. Uh, and this is an opportunity where other um, players uh, can also um, kind of enter, the, uh, you know, enter the scene or that they could change what they've been working on. Um, or they can reach out to, to new audiences as well. And so I think um, what we've seen is that um, people are realizing that there's, there's a whole world out there of consumers uh, and audience and um, you know, other people who could um, you know, appreciate the, the cultural goods and services that are being produced. So it doesn't have to be only people who are your core audience of people in your city or people in your country, but maybe there are people in another country, another continent or another, you know, another demographic, you know, that's interested in what you're doing and being stuck at home with nothing to do but stream internet content is, is introducing them to you and you to them. And so I think this is an opportunity to really, to seize that moment. Um, but I think we have to be very kind of intentional about it. It's not just going to happen really by itself. And so, this is where, you know, it goes back to the point about the role of the private sector and the role of the public sector. So governments need to do what governments need to do, right? They need to provide the, the tax incentives, they need to provide the subsidized, you know, venues where people can, you know, you know, create startups. They need to provide opportunities for upskilling and reskilling people with the new like digital skills and other skill sets that they need to have in order to navigate this new economic landscape, uh, this new way of life, you know. So um, that's what governments need to do. What are the key learnings do you think uh, the creative industries will take from this pandemic? I think I think really um, the, the value and the possibilities of collaboration. I mean, I think we've, we've seen a lot of people who 
have been creative types in the artist mold, like kind of, you know, I'm going to do my thing and this is, you know, these are, this is my audience and this is, you know, the people I, I work with. And, um, but we're seeing that um, through the pandemic at the kind of forced, um, forced proximity that's created through like online, new online platforms, uh, people are able to work, you know, across disciplines. So we have like, artists and designers working together or like fashion people working with food people and all this kind of stuff that's happening now. Uh, you also have people reaching out to across borders, you know, um, because it's, they're no longer limited by like a physical venue or a physical space. Um, and you're also um, having people work across industries. And so you have culture people reaching out to tech people or tourism people reaching out to, you know, social enterprises or whatever. So, so there's, there's all this kind of cross fertilization that's happening. And the question is, how do you build the architecture to make sure that that is sustainable, right? As a business proposition or as an economic proposition, but also as a social proposition, uh, and also as a kind of, um, an element of fostering creative expression as well. Um, and so, so, that support system needs to be in place. Otherwise, you know, this is, is going to fizzle out and right. not have the long-term impacts that it could possibly have. So that's the view of the future then? Well, I mean, I think that's, that's one view. I mean, I, I just came from a forum where in fact people were saying, or there could be a total lash, you know, like kind of a lashback, right? So in the same way that um, like film cameras now are really rare, but really super expensive, as opposed to like digital cameras, that there, there could be this whole, you know, lash pattern. people are like, enough, you know, the way that people are kind of like, you know, there's Zoom fatigue, um, but then there's also, there could just be like digital fatigue. And maybe it's like, I, I'm, I'm sick of listening to music, you know, by streaming, I, I need to go and listen to music in a cafe or, you know, whatever. But, that, but I think that's why people need to be open to kind of the blended modality of doing things. There's definitely gonna be a role for, you know, bricks and mortar, and there's probably going to be a, a big and, and growing role for, for online. So, so I think how to take advantage of both possibilities is going to be. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Montero, for joining us for this session. You've been listening to Montero Unaku from UNESCO Bangkok. I'm Maya Tan from Think City. If you have any questions, do contact us uh, from the details in the uh, session description. You can find out more about Think City by following us on Facebook at Think City or uh, Twitter and Instagram at MyThinkCity. Um, and you can also pay us a visit at www.thinkcity.com.my. Thank you once again, Montero. Yes, pleasure being with you.